happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. If you love your mom, show her today. Call her. Uh, if your mom has gone on to be with Jesus, just know she's having her best day ever. Um, I want to pray for you before we get into the word this morning. So if you would just close your eyes and let's set our heart and our focus back on him. Uh, Father, I just thank you for the awesome privilege today of bringing your word. I pray that your words would be my words. Father, I pray that you would open our ears to hear your voice, our hearts to receive from you, our eyes to see right now. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you here this morning. I thank Thank you for your presence that is here. I thank you for the worship that was lifted up this morning. I thank you, Jesus, that your name is like a banner over this house today. And I thank you, Father, that strongholds will be broken, that lives will be forever changed, that we will not leave here the same way we came, but that we would go forth from here changed by your glory, by your presence. So I thank you for all of that now in the mighty name of Jesus and that your word will go forth with boldness, with power and demonstration. And if you believe that, say amen and amen. And the title of this message this morning is The Right Place, The Right Time. Look at your neighbor and say you're at the right place at the right time. Let's look at your other neighbor. You're at the right place at the right time. And the text that we're looking at this morning is probably very familiar to many of you. It's in the book of John, chapter 5. And I'm reading from the Passion Translation. Uh, every year I take a different translation and read the Bible through. I just like to do that. It's just something that I like to do. So this year is the Passion Translation. TPT, which I thought stood for something else. But anyway, it is the Passion Translation. And it says, Then Jesus returned to Jerusalem to observe one of the Jewish holy days. I'm reading verse 1, sorry, through 8. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Aramaic, the House of Loving Kindness. Everybody say loving kindness. And this pool is surrounded by five covered porches. Hundreds of sick people were lying there on the porches, the paralyzed, the blind, and the crippled, all of them waiting for their healing. For an angel of God would periodically descend into the pool to stir the waters, and the first one who stepped into the pool after the water stirred would instantly be healed. Say instantly. Now there was a man, a man who had been disabled for 38 years, lying among the multitude of sick. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that the man had been crippled for a long time, so Jesus said to him, do you truly long to be healed? And the sick man answered him, sir, there's no way I can get healed, for I have no one who will lower me into the water. Then the, when the angel comes, and as soon as I try to crawl to the edge of the pool, someone else jumps in ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, stand up, pick up your sleeping mat, and you will walk. Immediately he stood up and he was healed. Amen. So he rolled up his mat and walked again. All right. Now, as you know, Jesus is always at the right place at the right time. Always. Amen. And I believe that today you are too, that this is a divine appointment. I know that God saw this on the calendar long before they ever asked me to be here. And so I just want to jump right into to what the Holy Spirit has laid on my heart. Now, as a mom, there is nothing that I love more than when my kids are healthy and whole and happy. And I believe that that's the way God is about his kids. He wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be whole. He wants us to have joy and to live the life that he purchased for us. And, and I always start lessons in my classroom. I'm a classroom teacher with a driving question. And the driving question today is, do you want to get well? And you might be thinking, well, I'm not sick. But I'm talking about emotionally, I'm talking about physically, I'm talking about mentally. Do you want to get well? And that's exactly what Jesus asked this man who had been sitting at this pool of loving kindness and who had been ill for more than 38 years. And when I first read it, I was like, well, how rude, Jesus. Of course he wants to get well. 
but Jesus is anything but rude. And a lot of times, if we don't know him personally, if we just have like a knowledge of him, but we don't have a relationship with him, we'll misunderstand the things that he asks us. We'll misunderstand the things that he tells us to do. And he never asks us a question that he doesn't already have the answer to. You hear me? Never. He knows. He's God. And he knew what this man was going to say. In fact, I believe he knew that this man was so desperate and so ready to have his healing. And when he asked him, he knew what he was going to say. Now, it's important to know that the, the pool was called the house of loving kindness. And I did a, a, quite an in-depth study on the word kindness a while back. And that word comes from the Greek, and forgive me if I butcher it, I I didn't take uh, Greek, but it comes from the word krestos. And that word means service. It means willing to help, to assist, to do whatever it takes. And that's what people expected when they came to this pool. They expected service. They expected assistance. They expected healing because they knew they had heard or they had seen that when that pool was stirred, that when they got in, they could get exactly what they came for. And I just think that it's so amazing that that's exactly where Jesus brought himself. He was there for a festival. And, and every year this festival happened and every year religious people would come to this area and there's no other account written of other religious people going to the pool. But that's where Jesus made his way first was to the pool. And if in the word of God, it says that he came for the sick, not the healthy. For those are the ones that need a doctor. That's Matthew 9, 12. And I am just so thankful that he came for me when I was sick. Anybody ever been sick? Anybody ever been emotionally tormented or depressed or, or just ill in your body? And he came for me and he waited for me and he sought me out. And uh, I grew up in a home that was volatile at best. A lot of times my father was an alcoholic. He was a drug addict. And if you have any experience with that, you know that that means there's lots of highs and lows and highs and lows. And so as a result of that, I, I was very ill emotionally. And for years, I sat at my own beside the pool and waited And I sat very sick and unhealthy and waited. And I am just so thankful that Jesus came for me. And, and you know, when you have unforgiveness, that's what I'm going to be talking about today and being made whole. When you have that, it paralyzes you. It puts you in a state where you are unable to move forward. And that's how I was. And, and my husband quotes Mark Gunger. He says, unforgiveness is like drinking the poison and expecting the other person to die. And that's what I had done. I drank the poison. I drank the lie of the enemy. You deserve to feel this way. You go ahead, have your pity party, send out the invites and just sit. And that's what I had done. And it was getting me nowhere real fast. And so when I began to study and pray and the Lord laid it on my heart to share this, there were five things that he brought out in this text. And number one was that in the crowd, Jesus saw one. In the crowd, Jesus saw one. Now, while he was on earth, Jesus was limited, but today he's not limited He can see each one of you individually and him seeing you doesn't affect him seeing me where I'm at and him seeing you doesn't affect where he sees you at. He's not limited. He's no respecter of persons. And he could have easily right here though in this text began to form a healing line and lay hands on all of the sick and have them recover. But when he came, he locked eyes on the one, the one who was sitting on that mat who had done all he could do within himself who had expended all the energy that he could. And he came and met him right where he was. He was moved. Jesus, whenever he walked the earth and still today, he is moved by compassion. He is moved by faith. 
And I believe that this man had a measure of faith. I mean, he kept coming back. Although he said he couldn't get in and he couldn't, he was too weak, he kept coming back. So he obviously had a measure of faith to believe that God was able to meet his need, to believe that he was able to have his healing. And so the point number one is that in a crowd of people, Jesus sees one. And y'all have this awesome campaign that you've had up here for a while, how he'll leave the 99 for the one. Y'all, he left the 99 for me. Did he leave the 99 for you? I mean, I'm just so thankful that that's the kind of God that we serve. And about 20 years ago when I was in Bible college, he sent someone to, to find me, to be his hands and his feet. I was in Bible college at Southwestern Assemblies of God University and uh, in, a, in a psychology class of all places. And I began to actually read the book and I thought, you know, I think there's something wrong with me. I think I might need some help. And uh, the professor was just so gracious and just full of the love of God. And uh, she prayed for me. I didn't even know she was praying for me. God will send people to pray for you. And um, one day I just felt this unction, this boldness to just go and say, you know what? I, I'm Dr. H, that's what I'll call her to just give a name. But I said, I, I really need to come talk to you. And she said, she looked me right in the face and she said, you know what? I know you do. I have been praying for you. And it just like overwhelmed me. And it was like God just reached down his hand to me and wrapped it around me, his arms around me. And anyway, um, I'm just so thankful for her. She helped me, uh, began to talk through some things in my life. And I just believe that God wants you to know that he sees you today. He sees you. He has you in the right place. He has people around you. And if you'll just open your eyes to see. The second thing that I want us to see today is that unforgiveness paralyzes you. Now, when I began to study this man, now when I was younger I, and heard the text, I thought that the man was born paralyzed, but he actually had some kind of illness that caused him to become so weak that it paralyzed him. It caused him to be so weak that he was unable to move. And that's what unforgiveness does to us. It causes us to be weak. It causes us to be stuck in the past. It chains us to the past. It causes us to not be able to experience the bright future, the bright hope that God has for us. And that's how I was. I, I was waiting on my dad to apologize to me. I thought, you know what? He did this. He owes me. And I'm waiting. Anytime now, anytime you want to pay that apology, I'm ready. And when I began to speak to this, this professor, she said, she listened to me. She listened to all my whining and all my complaining. And some things rightly so. I'm not trying to, you know, brush that off as, as that's not a bad thing whenever you go through abuse or whatever. But she looked at me right in the face and said, you know what? Yeah, he did that. But if you want to move forward, you're going to have to forgive. And I believe that's what the Holy Spirit has sent me here to tell you today, that if you want to move forward, you're going to have to let it go. You're going to have to leave the past where the past is. I mean, is it really doing anything for you anyway? Do you really feel good whenever you're, you stay trudging through the past? And you're going to have to let go and move forward. See, I was expecting my dad to pay a debt that he couldn't pay. A lot of us are expecting people to pay a debt to us that they cannot pay, y'all. The only one who can pay the debt is Jesus. And you know what? He already paid it. He's not coming back to do it again because he did it right the first time. And so that's what she told me. And uh, yeah, I wasn't real excited at first about it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to be like, oh, yeah, sign me up for that. But I took it in and I began to meditate on the word. Y'all, the word works. The word works. The word works. It accomplishes everything that it's sent forth to do. And so I began to meditate on that. And uh, one of the passages that my husband has been speaking on, uh, Matthew 18, uh, where Peter says to Jesus, how many times... Shall I forgive my brother if he sins against me? And he's like, seven. 
And I believe three is what they were required to do by law. And so Peter was probably like, "Mm, I'll more than double that. I'm doing good. Seven. But Jesus answers him and says, what y'all? 70 times seven. And when I began to read stuff like that, I thought, oh, yeah, I got to forgive. This is what I've got to do. And in that passage, Jesus goes on to talk about a servant who owed a debt that he could not pay. And the, the master forgives him of the debt, releases him. And that's what God is asking us to do. He is asking us to release those who have debted against us, to release those who have hurt us, to release those who have wronged us, not because they deserve it, but because you deserve that. You deserve the freedom that comes with that because Jesus paid the price already. Amen? The third thing is that moving forward requires you to introduce your facts to the truth. I'm going to say that again. To move forward, you got to introduce the facts, the things you see with these little beady eyes to the truth of God's word. Jesus asked this man, do you want to get well? The man answered him with the facts. I'm weak. When I try to get to the pool, someone gets ahead of me. Those were the facts. And Jesus introduced him to the truth. Healing. He told him in response, rise up, take your mat, and walk. So today, you need to introduce the facts that you're facing to God's truth, whatever it is. It might be sickness. It might be debt. It might be a relationship that's in shambles. You need to take those facts and say, facts meet the truth of God's word. I know it looks like this, but your word says that. I know I feel like this, but your word says that. And today I'm going to introduce my facts to the truth of God's word. Amen. Amen. We got to quit focusing on the circumstances. Y'all, I had spent a lot of years focusing on what my dad hadn't done, what he did do, how many people I could tell about it, and get them to go, oh, you know, and I'm not saying sometimes that we don't need someone to go, oh, and wrap their arm around us, but when it becomes a problem, you know it's a problem. When you are stuck in that, and that is all that consumes your life, and you are not able to move forward, it's a problem. It's time to let it go. And so I had to begin to focus on the Word. And I grew up in a church that talked a lot about faith. And I thought that I had faith. I knew that there were two parts of faith, speaking and believing, in Mark eleven twenty four, 24. And all, I'm not going to go in depth into that whole passage, but you know where Jesus is telling them, if you say to this mountain, be thou removed and it will be cast into the sea, what whoever believes and says it shall be done. And then a lot of us skip over the next verse that comes right after us in verse 25 and says, whenever you stand praying, if you find that you carry something in your heart against another person, release him and forgive him so that your Father in heaven will also release you and forgive you. But if you will not release forgiveness, don't expect your Father to release his, to release forgiveness for you. Y'all, I need his forgiveness. (sighs) I need it. So I got to release it. And I had been speaking and believing for my father and our relationship to be restored until I was blue in the face. And my husband says, you can believe and speak until you're blue in the face. But if you don't walk in love, you're just going to be blue in the face. (laughs) I'm going to say that again because it's real good. You can believe and speak until you're blue in the face. But if you don't walk in love, you don't forgive. You're just going to be blue in the face. And I was real blue in the face real sad, real angry. And it took me seeing this and meditating on the word. In fact, if you don't see results in your life, if there's some things that you've been praying for and you've you've got the word on that situation, I'm not talking about crazy, hyper, goofy things. I'm talking about things where you can find a promise in the word to stand on and you're not seeing a result, check your love walk. I have to do it all the time. I haven't arrived at some love walk pinnacle. I'm still walking this out day in and day out. In fact, the word says that it's impossible for offense not to come, but woe through whom it comes. 
So offense is going to come, y'all, because we're people. And people are messy. But people are also wonderful. And they're also the currency of heaven. That's the only thing we're taking with us to heaven. We can't take the stuff. We can't take our house. We can't take our job, our career, our success, whatever it is that, that fuels you. Only thing we can take to heaven is people. And that is what Jesus left for us is the ministry of reconciliation, not alienation. Reconciliation means bringing people in, bringing them close, no matter what, no matter what they've done to you, bringing them in, bringing them close. Y'all, we all spit in the face of Jesus and he died for us anyway while we were yet sinners. He didn't wait till we were cleaned up. He didn't wait till we had it all together. He didn't wait until everything was just at the right place. He died for us while we were yet sinners. And if he died for us and he's commanded us to love the way he loves, we're going to have to love people in some unlovely situations. It's just the way it is. Uh, number four, leave no room to return to your old life. Leave no room to return to your old life. Jesus told the man to pick up his mat. That mat represented his old way of life. It represented the 38 years that he sat and sat and sat and waited and was ill and felt bad and was sick. Leave your mat. Pick it up. Get rid of it. So you don't go back. Some of us need to leave no room. We need to get rid of some stuff. Not people. We need to get rid of some old ways of thinking. The Bible says that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Renewing is an ongoing thing. We got to renew our minds. That's where a lot of things happen. That's where the battle is, is right there in our mind, in between these ears. And if we'll renew our mind, then we'll begin to see a change in our actions. Because what goes around in this head drops in our heart. Then it comes out of our mouth. Then it, it flows over into our actions. And that's what Jesus is asking this man to do here when he tells him to pick up his mat. Uh, I don't know what that looks like for you. But for me, it looked like this. I had to quit telling people how bad my life had been and start telling them how good my God was. I had to quit telling them what my dad had done to me and start telling them what my Jesus did in me. Amen? Amen. And then uh, the fifth thing is when you get tired of being ill, you don't care what other people think about you. You're so sick of it. You're sick of being sick. You don't care what people think. See, this happened on the Sabbath, which was a no-no. That man, I'm pretty sure, knew that he probably was not supposed to receive his healing. Jesus certainly knew the law, but he did it anyway. Jesus fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the law. The, the, the religious people were busy trying to fit him in the box of what they knew about religion. And he was busy trying to set them free from that and let them know that love, his love fulfilled that law. And this man didn't care when the religious people began to say, why are you holding your mat? It is against the law for you to be healthy. He didn't care. He didn't even know who had done it. He didn't even know who Jesus really was because he couldn't even tell him who did it. In fact, Jesus goes back and finds him because the man was in the temple giving praise and thanks as was custom after healing. And Jesus finds him and tells him, don't go back to your sinful life. In other words, today you are healed. You are set free. You are new. So I'm real practical saying all that. One, Jesus sees you in a crowd. In a crowd, he sees one. Two, unforgiveness paralyzes you. Three, make sure I get it all in order, sorry. Moving forward requires you to introduce your facts to the truth of God's word. Four, don't leave any room to go back to your old life. Five, when you get tired of being ill, when you're tired of it long enough, you don't care what anybody thinks about you. You don't care if they know that about you because you're just ready to move forward. How can I do that today? Well, one, I can just obey the words of Jesus. I can just obey what he says. 
Just like the paralyzed man, when Jesus said, rise up, he didn't ask him 50 questions. Well, Jesus, how do I do that? Well, do I stand on the right foot first or the left foot? Well, should I scoot over a little bit this way so I don't bump into this person? I mean, do we not do that? He gives us instructions and they're perfectly good instructions and we just start with the rapid fire questions. Only me? Okay, I see. We're going to be holy in here. I do it. I'll call myself out. I ask a lot of questions. So we just need to obey him. In John 15, 12, he says, so this is my command. Love each other deeply as I have loved you. Y'all, that would take care of all of life's problems right there. Every single one. Love each other deeply as I have loved you. Not shallow. Not while I feel like it. Not because you did something nice for me. Not because it's Mother's Day. Not because it's Easter. Not because it's Christmas. It doesn't say that. It says love each other deeply as he loved us. How did Jesus love us? I already said it once today, Romans 5, 8, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He gave his life for us. While we were sinners, while we were a mess, while we were against him, as my son says, he, he, he died for us. He, he reached out to us. And that's what I did. I was waiting for an outstretched arm from my dad. I was waiting for a phone call. I was waiting for an I'm sorry, a legitimate I'm sorry. And Jesus looked at me and said, no, you stretch your arm out. He did. You do the phone call. You say you're sorry for your attitude. You give the hug. You go to prison and sit with him. You bring him what he wants while he's in there. And then even when my dad was out and he uh, was diagnosed with cancer, I was right there with him every step of the way. And I just thank God that I was able to do that, that somebody loved me enough, that God loved me enough to send that doctor to me and say to me, forgive. And Jesus loves you enough to say to you, whoever you are today, just forgive them. Just let it go. Just stretch your arm out to that person. It doesn't matter. It might be really painful. I understand. But just do it. That's my second thing. Apply the Nike principle. Just do it. Just do it. Uh, the man at the pool didn't reason with Jesus. He just did it. You know, the, Holy, the word of God says that the love of God has been shed in our, abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. We all have a measure of the God kind of love on the inside of us. We just got to stir it up by the Holy Ghost. And sometimes that just means praying in tongues. This is a spirit-filled church, right? Sometimes you just got to pray in tongues. Jude says, building up my most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. I spent a lot of days, I would climb up to the prayer tower at Southwestern and pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. I had other things I could be doing, but that was the most important thing that I could be doing. Pray. The third thing is just resolve to be at peace as far as it concerns you. Because some people, that's in Romans 12, 18, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably. Because some people you're going to forgive, and guess what? They're not going to reciprocate. They're not going to say sorry back to you. It may not ever be right as on their end, but you can be right on your end. And when it comes to forgiveness, you got to leave your feelings out of it. It's a one-time choice that you make. You say, today I'm going to forgive. You forgive, you release them, and you move forward. Now, renewing your mind is not a one-time choice. That's a daily thing. So the first thing is, is I'm going to obey, I'm going to forgive. The second thing is, is I'm going to renew my mind day by day and walk that thing out. No matter what happens. Now, I'm not saying trust somebody who has repeatedly hurt you. Trust and forgiveness are two different things. Trust is earned. If you're in an abusive situation, obviously, you don't need to stay and be beat or be cheated on or whatever. I mean, you know, use your sense in that, but you can forgive. 
you can choose to let that stuff go and move forward. You don't have to trust. I'll make that real clear. Because I didn't just immediately start trusting everything my dad said. I didn't immediately start giving my heart. But I, I did forgive. I did pray for him. I did renew my mind. Until one day I just realized, you know what? I really love him. I'm really thankful for him. And it was the most beautiful and wonderful feeling. And I'm not standing up here this morning to say this from a place of pride or from arrogance. I'm standing up here this morning because Jesus loves you. And the Holy Spirit sent me to tell you that Jesus sees you today. And that it's time that you're at the right place. You're with the right people. And it's time to move forward. It's time to move forward. It's time to let it go. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask that every head be bowed right now.